short as possible, please. Our next item of business is a statement by Jean Freeman on delivering social security for Scotland's people. The Minister will take questions at the end of her statement, so there should be no intervention and interruptions. Okay. And I call on Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today I want to set out more detail on how we will deliver new powers over social security for people in Scotland including what people can expect from Scotland's new Social Security Agency and how we came to the decision on its configuration. I will also provide an update to members on our progress to abolish the bedroom tax at source and delivering choice in universal credit on rent payment direct to landlords and twice monthly payment. I was delighted to be with the First Minister yesterday when she announced the agency's headquarters will be in Dundee with a second major site in Glasgow. But as I announced in April, our new agency will offer a local presence across Scotland, supported by these efficient central functions. Throughout the consultation and since, the importance of that local presence, that human face, has been consistently expressed. It is this local aspect that marks a key difference between our agency and what currently exists. For the agency, our aim is twofold to give every person entitled to one of the benefits we will be responsible for the information, advice and support in applying that they need and to complement what is already out there and working well. Since April, my officials have so far met with 17 local authorities and many third sector organisations to understand the particular needs in each local authority area and the current partnership provision where it exists. I'm grateful that COSLA is working collaboratively with us on this and confirm that we are jointly developing an overarching partnership agreement on the guiding principles to underpin delivery and secure a consistency of approach across Scotland, building local social security services that are tailored to local needs. We will not compromise the level of service we require and expect and for which we will be accountable. It will always be our agency staff meeting and helping individuals, not private companies. People will always be treated with dignity and respect, and we will always meet the expectations of the Charter that we are developing with the people of Scotland. That is both our ambition and our expectation. Presiding Officer, let me now describe what the service might look like to those we are serving. We know that increasing benefit take-up is a challenge. If a person is unsure of what they may be entitled to, our local staff will offer advice on the benefits that we will deliver alongside wider income maximisation support. If a person is looking to apply for a benefit, we will support them to complete the forms and advise on the evidence needed to support their application. And where a person is already receiving benefits, they will be able to get face-to-face -face advice on their payments, on notifying the agency of a change in their circumstances, on other benefits they may be entitled to, or in making a complaint where their expectations have not been met. Above all, our service will be proactive, positive and geared to helping the individual in their particular circumstances. The agency's local presence will be supported by vital central functions, like case handling, payment systems, contact staff and the corporate roles that any efficient public body needs. We have followed a robust multi-criteria assessment process in keeping with our evidential approach to designing the social security system in determining the two locations announced. Dundee will be the agency headquarters, supporting regeneration in that area and demonstrating our commitment that key public services are not restricted to the central belt. Glasgow will be our main administrative site in the west of Scotland, offering equal service capacity and capability and ensuring the agency can deliver continuity in its crucial services. As members will see in the evidence published today, each part of the country was assessed against a variety of socio-economic factors. We have considered the scale of economic opportunity that over 1,500 jobs can generate, plus the scale of risk to business continuity if we were to choose a single site. The sensible decision was to have two major locations of similar scale. Dundee and Glasgow both performed very well against the criteria 
and will benefit from the ability to attract staff from a wide catchment area, thus spreading the economic benefit that new jobs will bring. But, presiding officer, these central functions will not be hidden away in an industrial estate or a business park, out of reach to those whom they are there to support. We will, of course, seek efficiency and effectiveness in line with our social security principles, but these two locations will also form part of our local network. They too will be public facing, open, welcome and accessible. Presiding officer, we've already been clear that agency staff right across Scotland will be present and that the economic benefit from the, this new public service will be spread. I've spoken previously about at least 1,500 staff being required in those two locations. As we move closer to the delivery of the first devolved benefits, we are clearer on the likely human resource required. I can therefore confirm that we expect the Social Security Agency to be employing around 250 staff by summer 2019 to 2018 to deliver our first benefits, carers allowance supplement, our best start grant and funeral expenses assistance. In addition to the central functions, we also estimate that at least 400 additional jobs will be created for the locally based agency presence. This number will be refined as we continue to work to design the service with local authorities and others, but it illustrates the scale of our commitment to local delivery. We recognise the scale of endeavour involved in staffing up an organisation of this size. So we will therefore work with local colleges, employability services and other partners to ensure that we have the right supply of people to work in our agency. Before concluding, presiding officer, I want to update members on our work to abolish the bedroom tax. I'm sure members will recall that our absolute commitment to abolish the tax had encountered some difficulties prior to the summer recess. I met with ministers from the DWP last week and I'm happy to report substantial progress in that we now have an agreed proposal that will fully mitigate the bedroom tax without funding being clawed back or the support that we provide to those to whom the tax applies being limited by the operation of the UK government's benefit cap. I hope to be in a position to bring forward an amendment at stage two of the Social Security Bill to provide full legal cover for the technical solution. I also want to update members on the work we have been doing on universal credit flexibilities that will be delivered by the DWP on our behalf from the 4th of October this year. The flexibilities will offer people in Scotland the choice to have their housing costs paid directly to their landlord and to have twice monthly payments. We have now tested our work directly with those who will use the service to make sure we are being clear about what is offered so that informed choices can be made and people are clear about what they need to do. Presiding officer, the Social Security Agency delivery configuration is not about bricks and mortar. It is first and last about a public service that exemplifies our founding principles of dignity, fairness and respect in how it works as an organisation, how it works for those who need that support and how it cooperates with its partners across our public sector. I want us to be clearly at the opposite end of the spectrum from the existing DWP system of distrust, misery and despair. That is why we have set the groundwork for a public body with a rights-based service at its heart that will employ staff who are proud of what they do and who will create a positive and respectful culture to deliver the service that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would uh, urge all members who wish to ask a question following the statement to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, presenting officer. And I thank the minister for early sight of um, her statement. And I, as a Glasgow MSP, I'm of course particularly pleased about the Glasgow uh, news. I'm also very pleased with uh, the report that she gave to the Chamber a few minutes ago about uh, the update of the work of the Joint Ministerial Working Group on Welfare, which has delivered further progress on joint government working and the smooth delivery of um, devolved welfare. What Scots want to see is their two governments working together, and I'm very pleased uh, that the Minister was able to report on that a few minutes ago. Can I ask the Minister two sets of questions, both of which she's been asked before? 
and both of which I think continue to bother um, opposition uh, MSPs from across the chamber about the delivery of social security, devolved social security, first about jobs and then about costs. How many of the 1,500 jobs that the Minister talked about in her statement are new? And how many are replacement jobs for people already in employment uh, at DWP? And how many of the 250 jobs that she says will be in place by the summer of 2019 are new? And how many of them are replacement jobs for positions that already exist in the DWP? And how many of the 400 locally based jobs um, that she talked about in her statement are new? And how many are replacement jobs? I hope those questions are sufficiently clear to get a clear answer. Secondly, about costs. And I asked the Minister about this in general questions last week, and I wasn't satisfied with the answer with respect, so I'm going to have another go and see if I can get a little bit more uh, detail on this. The financial memorandum accompanying the very important Social Security Bill that the Minister introduced in June and that the Social Security Committee is now considering uh, it includes within it a cost that the IT provision within the Social Security Agency um, about which the Minister has given a statement today will be £190 million. The Auditor General last Thursday morning uh, told the Social Security Committee that she was not in a position to assure the Committee about the robustness of that figure. So my question on this figure of £190 million, and the Minister didn't include any figures about costs anywhere in her statement today, is how can she help us as MSPs from across the Chamber be assured that that £190 million figure is robust? Cabinet Secretary, uh, sorry, Minister. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to do my best um, to answer all of Mr. Tompkins' questions, and I'm grateful to him for those parts of the statement that he welcomed. Um, in terms of jobs, how many are new and how many are replacement jobs? At the moment, we are working through exactly the detail of each of those 1,500 jobs. How many people do we need, for example, in terms of case management? How many do we need in terms of the payment system or of document handling and so on? As we do that, and we do that in consultation with PCS in our uh, agency uh, partnership forum and with others, we will be able to identify from there whether any or some of those jobs that we require are jobs currently done in Scotland by the DWP on the benefits that will be devolved to us. So I do not have an exact number for you, Mr. Tompkins. My expectation is that a small number may well be existing DWP jobs in Scotland administering or dealing with the benefits that we will be responsible for, but it will be a small number because the bulk of that work in the DWP is conducted south of the border. So I will be able, as we move through that exercise, uh, to advise you of exactly what I think the split will be. And of course, where there are jobs that uh, are comparable to jobs being done by DWP staff in Scotland right now on any one of those 11 benefits, then we will, of course, uh, apply to, uh, apply, comply with the uh, public sector version of TUPE. And my apologies again to members of the chamber. I clearly have a mental block about what that is, but I'm sure members know what I'm talking about. On the, the 250 jobs that I said we would uh, have working, or staff that we will have working, uh, in order to deliver the first phase, and it is indeed by summer 2019, in incrementally recruited, there are uh, 2019, 2018. No, it's 2019. Um, incrementally recruited in total as we build it, 30 of those jobs currently exist inside the Social Security Directorate. They are individuals who were recruited to begin that work for us. These are all new jobs, and my expectation is that uh, all, or if not all, almost all of those 250 jobs will be new in order to deliver those new benefits. But again, as we clarify what the DWP does in terms of jobs, I will be able to advise Mr. Tompkins and other members of the exact detail and happy to do so. Um, in terms of the 400 locally based staff, and, and remember to please that that is at this point an estimate. It may be higher, it may be lower. And the reason it is an estimate is because we need to work with each local authority area to ensure that what we deliver 
fits with what was already on the ground and also to take account of the different demands of each local authority area. Rural, author rural authorities, for example, require uh, a different uh, configuration of staff in, in terms of how they're deployed. Um, but those jobs are new. They are new local social security staff based in local authorities across Scotland. And DWP currently has no comparable jobs in that area. Now, on IT costs, let me start by reminding members and Mr Tompkins of one of the key lessons from Audit Scotland in terms of how to uh, create an IT system to support any uh, major project or any major public service. And, and I need to say clearly that for me, the IT the IT is a supporting part of the infrastructure. It's not the driver, it is a supporting part of the infrastructure to deliver on what is the driver, which is social security policy, that rights-based system, and so on and so forth. One of the clear lessons was, don't build it all at once. Take it in chunks, manageable chunks, and build flexibility into that, which is precisely how we are building the IT system, the infrastructure to support our overall delivery of social security. Again, as we draw down responsibility for the benefits incrementally, as we recruit incrementally to deliver, as we build our agency incrementally, so too do we build our IT incrementally. In terms of therefore, how do you get uh, overall estimate of cost? And Mr. Tompkins, I know, will have read the finance memorandum in great detail. So he will know that that 190 million carries a number of caveats in order to be sure that we all understand what we're saying. And those caveats detail the assumptions that are made in reaching that 190 fig million figure. And what, what we did was because we're building it chunk by chunk, then you determine the cost as you go chunk by chunk. But at this point, we need a finance memorandum for a bill. So we looked with our digital in-house experts inside the Scottish Government at what would you need for a, that social security system in the round? What would you need in terms of case management, verification, documentation handling? What kind of IT would you need? And then used the costs that have been incurred previously in various projects, looked to find some clear analytical basis to... Uh, judge those and come with a figure and on the basis of all of that 190 million but as we were clear i think at finance committee but certainly let me be clear now that figure itself will be refined as we go through that it build and my officials i understand have uh, offered or very shortly will offer finance committee the opportunity to hear in more detail um, how we are going about that it build but i hope overall that gives Mr Tompkins a bit more detail and certainly a bit more assurance that we are approaching this in a soundly based, robust way, bearing in mind that we are taking it all step by step. And those need to be the caveats around it. The assumptions we've made are very clear in the finance memorandum and the approach we're taking, I think, is one that is sensible and sound. Thank you. That was it. Thank you. Very detailed questions, even more detailed answers, which is to be applauded, although I'm very conscious of time. Uh, Mark Griffin, as the opening speaker for Labour, gets a slightly longer question. I would urge all members and ministers to keep the answers very tight from now on. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for advance sight of the statement. We welcome the news that the bedroom tax will finally be abolished at source since it has been a long-held ambition of ours going way back to when Jackie Bailey had her initial proposal for a member's bill. The minister talks about agency staff meeting people, not private companies, and also about income maximisation. I wonder if the minister would be able to say if the government plan on introducing amendments at stage two to that effect, so that people have the assurance of primary legislation, and that future governments can't change those principles with such ease that we both agree on. And on universal credit as well, we welcome the additional flexibilities, but would again ask about the situation regarding split payments. 
since evidence heard last week at the Social Security Committee shows that Northern Ireland are working towards those flexibilities with the D DWP. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you for, to the member for his comments. In terms of whether or not I can commit to amendments at stage two on the questions that he raises, the answer is no, uh, because I think it is really important that I hear all of the evidence that the Social Security Committee itself is hearing. I'm continuing to have discussions with stakeholders on a number of aspects uh, in terms of our draft bill, clarifying my position, which I think has been clear up until now, but clarifying it again on questions around scrutiny and around the Charter. And so at the end of, as we go through that process, and as my officials produce, I hope helpfully for the committee, themed papers on a number of issues, as we get to, uh, through that process, then I will take a view on what I think would be government, appropriate government amendments at stage two or amendments that may come forward that uh, we think the government would be able to support. So at this point, I'm not saying yes and I'm not saying no. Uh, in terms of split payments, uh, the member is absolutely right. I'm conscious of the work that Northern Ireland is doing. Uh, I think he and I have discussed before, I've certainly discussed with his colleague, Ms McNeill, some of the complexities around actually delivering this, notwithstanding our commitment to do that. And so we are currently working our way through some of those uh, complexities with an eye to what Northern Ireland is doing, but also taking further discussion from some of our key stakeholder groups in terms of being able to do this in a way that is uh, legislatively robust and deliverable. Thank you. So I remind members, no preamble, no explanation, just a question. OK, just a question. Sandra White to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, can the Minister uh, provide more detail on what level of jobs she expects to be available in both Glasgow and Dundee? And uh, would she agree that those who have lived the experience of the current system, for um, example, those taking part in the experience panels, uh, should be encouraged to apply for some of these jobs? Minister. Thank you very much. The, the kind of... Uh, uh, service that those uh, two locations will be providing to Social Security as a whole is case management, case handling, decision making, document verification, uh, identity verification, payment systems themselves, corporate governance, uh, appeals and so on. So those are the jobs that flow from that. In terms of uh, who applies, I am a firm believer in as diverse a workforce as we can possibly manage. Our workforce should reflect uh, those that we serve. But of course, we also need to recruit in a way that is uh, sustainable, is defensible, and we recruit the right people with the right skills to the right jobs. And that will be the approach that we take. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by George Adam. Jeremy uh, thank you, President Officer. Would the Minister agree with me that however outward facing the new agency is, it will not be independent of the state and that new claimants will still require independent advice on occasions. Will she commit to funding those organisations that give her independent advice? And will she also give a commitment to make sure that is in the bill, that there's a statutory right for independent advice where appropriate? Minister. Um, well, the, the Social Security Agency is an agency of government, so I guess in that sense, um, it is an independent of the state, it's a curious phrase. Um, in terms of advocacy and advice, I have long accepted the importance of that. I'm not prepared uh, in making this statement today in this chamber, presiding officer, to preempt the proper scrutiny of our bill as it goes through the committee stage and commit as I wasn't to Mr. Griffin there. I'm not prepared to commit to funding or, or to any other matter in terms of the bill. I think the due process, the proper process, for me as a responsible government minister to take, is to listen to the evidence that comes before the committee, to continue my discussions with stakeholders, to hear what my experience panels are telling me, and then to form a view on what makes the right decisions for government in terms of either additional amendments or accepting amendments that may come from uh, other parties, and that is precisely what I'll do. George Adam to be followed by Polly McNeill. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister provide further detail on when she expects the local network to be up and running, which will obviously undoubtedly benefit communities across Scotland? Minister. 
I thank Mr Adam. So, as members will recall, uh, I said that our officials are currently working with uh, local authorities and other local partners to identify what is the right model uh, in each local authority area, accepting that there will be difference uh, between local authority areas across the country. The end results and the quality of service and the consistency of approach will be the same, but the model may be different. So, what we are looking to do is have in some uh, early areas uh, test models so that in place by 2018-19, so in place uh, in terms of our first delivery of our first benefit, the carers supplement, so that we begin, begin to test how those models may work and how effective they are in working alongside uh, other partners and then we will roll those out uh, across the country as appropriate. So the date Mr Adams is looking for is 2018-19. Polly McNeill to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, does the Minister accept that independent advocacy in the new system would be a good thing and notwithstanding what she said to Jeremy Balfour, what is the government's own position on there being uh, independent adv advocacy within the new system and does she remain open-minded on that question? Minister. Um, so, uh, can I answer the second part first? I, yes, I do remain open-minded. I'm pretty open-minded generally, actually. But um, in terms of independent ad ad advocacy, I do see the value of that. But I think, can I just make a general point? And I, I've made this to stakeholders, presiding officer, and I think it's important to make it. I, I understand that to an extent, all of us come to this question, to the question of a social security system in Scotland, through the prism of our experience of the DWP and uh, how it has operated and how people have been and also feel they have been treated under that system. I need all of us to take a wee step back and recognise that that prism is precisely what that is. And therefore, whilst we might argue very forcefully about the need for um, significant levels of advocacy in the current UK system, particularly around appeals, particularly around disability benefits, our approach and our intent in how we will change that system, how we will make better decisions first time, remove the private sector from face-to-face health, -face health assessments and reduce significantly the numbers of them, I think alters how we might view some of these other matters. So my mind is open on how we best approach this, but I need us to recognise that we inevitably and understandably look at it from the current experience, and we need to recognise that what we are bringing forward is significantly and materially different from that. Alison Johnson to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I thank the Minister for early sight of her statement and apologise for missing the opening in the Chamber. Um, does the Minister agree that we need to have a statutory right to income maximisation support and that the Social Security Bill would be the place to do this? And does the government intend to use powers under Section 35 of the Social Security Bill to provide payments without an application? Thank you. Minister. So I, th I think I missed the last part. D d can I just check if the member asked if it was payments without application? Yes. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the member might be referring to there, and I'm perfectly happy to discuss that with her uh, offline, as it, as it were. Um, in terms of uh, income maximisation, then I do accept the absolute importance of that. I note that local authorities have a role in, in this too, and in order to ensure that we're not um, willy-nilly handing out statutory requirements, you know, left, right and centre to local authorities and to Scottish Government, I think I need a conversation with my colleagues in local authorities and perhaps also with Ms Johnson herself to look at how we might best achieve a cohesive income maximisation uh, provision for people across Scotland. And Mike Rumbles. Can the Minister assure us that her approach to the IT system, which she outlined earlier to Adam Tompkins, is dramatically different to the approach taken by her colleague Fergus Ewing in the field of the IT systems for our, our agricultural payments? Is it a dramatically different approach? Minister. 
Well, my approach is, as I'm sure Mr Ewing's approach uh, was, and that is to learn the lessons from those previous IT projects that work well and those that work less well, both in Scotland and at a UK level. I can only talk in detail about the approach that we are taking for Social Security. I'm perfectly happy to, at some point, uh, following the uh, uh, presentation and discussion with Finance Committee, if colleagues there choose to accept that offer from my officials on our IT bill to extend that to other members across this chamber. And I hope that uh, if we do that, that they will see for themselves that our approach is uh, building on the lessons learned across a whole range of IT projects, not least universal credit, I have to say, uh, and uh, taking a staged, sensible, managed approach uh, to building IT and not, as the Audit Scotland report says, going for one big bang. Thank you very much. Apologies to members who didn't get a chance to ask their question there. I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Uh, we now move on to a government statement on homelessness. We'll just take a few seconds for members to change and ministers to change seats.